We are a group of students from George Mason University. Development in Eritrea has been extraordinary with very little international assistance. To be back in Eritrea is always a joy for me. But to bring 11 students and have them experience Eritrea, that is really a dream. Originally, before coming to Eritrea, I had no expectations. A lot of people warned me about the trip and they wanted to make sure that the university would put this bubble shrink wrap around us um, to be really safe. I was very open-minded about it, but also very cautious. All I knew about the country was from books, from articles, and from stories that non-Eritreans shared with me, and mostly was concerned about safety. Because you don't hear a lot about Eritrea in America and the United States. I was really surprised. I've traveled to a lot of developing countries, and even immediately upon arrival in Eritrea, it became abundantly clear that this was a completely different country. There were no guns at the airport. Um, when we came out of the building, everything was clean. And when we entered the city, people were walking around. Um, and even at, at night, there was no restrictions to leave the hotel. It was just a very welcoming atmosphere. And from day one, I knew that um, the stories that I heard were not true. Among the things that we did that was so impressive was we had access to government officials, we had access to people working in the fields. We also got the opportunity to talk to different ministers and their goals to this country. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Asunara. I come from a school of conflict analysis and resolution, which is all about trying to build peace between uh, former uh, combatants or former adversaries. It's very rare for Americans to have any insight into what's happening here, and the insight that we have is usually uh, passed through a lens which is largely distorted uh, based on the history of conflict. This has been one of the most important and troubling conflicts in the world, and so we've been interested in it for a long time. Many people who know the conflict well warned me, you're going to love the people, but you're going to hate the government. But what I found is that the people in the government are not so easily separated and that the people that we've met in the government are extremely gracious and welcoming and open and have opened the country to us in a way that has allowed us to be very critical and to ask any question that we wanted to ask and to explore in a way that is surprising. I'm a private sector person. My 20 years in the World Bank was preaching privacy. I'm sure when you talk to the international community here, you will be told that the Eritrean government does not support the virus. They stop the matter. That's not true. Go back to our constitution, go back to the charter, go to the investment court, go to the macro policy document. It will show you that the private sector, in fact, is encouraged, conceptual. I see and I witnessed hope in this country that they will actually make uh, Eritrea better with their uh, social justice programs and also their interest to develop their people based on their own uh, development agenda. The last 20 years were not known. So we have to do a lot of things that basically to cope with it. As an economist, I may not like a lot of the policies from a pure economic point of view, but I also am a realist. I accept what government is doing because that is the choice that we have made. We will make peace here with Egypt. The second thing is that we are 100 percent sure that the living conditions in Eritrea will be much better. Also, fight for us. Something that really resonated with me during this trip was being back home. My background is Eritrean and I am a social worker. 
uh, my interest is in social development and how the social programming is intertwined with many of these kind of ministries and departments. Uh, the last time I came to Eretra, I was seven years old. Being able to go back to Mandafara and be with, back to my roots and being able to share that experience with the group was something that truly touched me. On the trip to Mandafara, the whole, co whole community was there and we got to meet the different leaders in the community and to see how, the, how the, despite the fact there are nine different ethnic groups and many different religions, they're all getting along and cohabiting peacefully. The one place that I really, really loved and enjoyed was Mendefada. Um, in particular, the hospital. I was really uh, impressed with all of the improvements and things that they've been able to do. Dr. Solomon was very gracious in showing us the, the uh, NICU and um, just that everybody there was fantastic. So Mendefada by far was my, my most favorite memory. <laughs> One of the experiences that made me emotional and made me really connected with the history and with the past is our visit to Adukwala. Hearing about the struggle firsthand from frontline fighters was, um, it was life changing. So the war started at the mountains that you're seeing here in Taidabak? Kuhayim. Kuhayim. So it's Eritrean land. Uh, they also tried to make an entry at a place called Maidama, but they returned here and the war started at the mountain that you see in front of us. This is the command post. This is the trenches over there on the street. There is a big, some um, stones beach. There was a very difficult war here for, that took place for three days. Day very, very gruesome. It did not end. Day, night, it took place. There was no breaks for three days straight. There were no breaks at all. No eating, no break, no drinking, nothing. So finally, there's a village here called Abid Al, and the, the Ethiopian troops were able to infiltrate that village. So both areas are very, as you can see, they're very steep um, and mountainous, so it's difficult to get to this area. So the two mistakes that they made were coming to this area and to another area called Sanafet. So they were also here to the right. And the Ethiopian troops also got very close to as, as close to as where we're standing. You can't think that someone that has our artillery or our guns would be able to pass through this, to the, through this area. Standing on those hills and looking down and thinking about the lives lost, the sacrifices people have made living or striving, you know, for their, their government agenda is something uh, that has really touched me and also uh, get me into thinking again about, you know, the importance of peace and how we can actually bridge peace into uh, countries that are brothers. How have Eritreans in this region, have they been able to cope with the trauma of Battles. Thank you. Yeah, we can talk to them. These people are here and we can talk to them. Elder's name is Aboy Girmay Tolde. Uh, he was here at the time uh, of the 1998-2000 war. He said, I buried my children. So he's talking about the Eritreans that martyred. He was one of the people that buried them after they lost their lives. <laughs> Uh, so nobody told them to leave. It was when the battle started. They took their stuff to one area and then they came back to help the troops. 
so when the battle started, they'd have injured sh- soldiers, they'd have uh, soldiers that were martyred. This was one of the people, along with the rest of the community at that time, that helped to either help save the injured soldiers or bury the martyred soldiers. Being an Ethiopian and being in Eritrea has been a great experience that I will always uh, think about and remember. The most important thing is uh, we are two countries now, but brothers and sisters who have lost 20 years and many years of conflict, through conflict. I believe we, the younger generations, are the ones who can actually bridge the gap for the last 20 years. And I hope things are going to be uh, a great ones because of the peace agreement that we have now. And the only solution actually to bridge that gap and to bridge the gap between the people of Eritrea and Ethiopia is peace. And now we have the peace and that is the greatest achievement that these two countries have achieved. How much uh, land are we disputing here? Eight, approximately 800 meters. And look how long we fought for this small, small piece of land. Sorry. It's a loss. One experience that I think I want to share is me getting to the matter's graveyard and seeing an old woman, not so old, cry over the tomb of, you know, it's a son or a, a daughter. And I moved closer and I saw the date. And it read 1981 to 2000. I sat down with her and I held her because I knew what that meant. If that child had been alive today, that child would be taking care of her. And I couldn't imagine what I was doing in 2000 in my own country and what someone else was doing for his or our country. the real sense of patriotism, the real sense of loyalty, the execution of I, myself, and the upliftment of we, that collective nature of Eritreans, stands out. with the experience um, on the eve of Martyrs Day um, is an experience that I will never forget. To see such large crowds, the entire city of Asmara just stopping for a moment to recognize um, and to acknowledge and to pay respects to all their families that uh, played uh, such critical roles in, in helping the country get to the point that it is today. I was just blown away by that experience to see so many out there singing the national anthem, um, really sharing with one another, and uh, having little kids come to me to light to light their candles was such a, a precious moment. Um, it's it's certainly an experience I'll never forget.
in many cities you travel to, where you have you know these large scale events, um, it's clear that the event happened. You know, you see the streets and there's trash, and it's and there there are little things here and there that show you that there are large crowds. But we woke up this morning and there was nothing there. Um, it was almost as if the city didn't stop, even though we could feel it and we knew that it had. The highlight of my trip, which really to me signifies or, or integrates the history, the current situation and the future, was our trip to Masawa. It was so um, interesting, saddened, but also enlightening to see the ruins of Masawa and to have the reminders of the really painful history. What I learned was that from great and much suffering comes great resilience. And we definitely have seen that resilience at play and during our trip by ingenious programs that have been put together with a really deep care for the land, for the, for the people and for development and for growth. It's almost back five years ago we start to make our preparation, especially focusing on the mining companies is coming up or developing in Eritrea. The factories that we visited, which were super clean and with the newest equipment, and the, all the workers were excited to work there and were very detailed in explaining us how their factories operated. So we try to build to port expansion by ourselves, within our people, by bringing selected material from outside and stretch it on the ground, compact it, and make it, make it ready for the cargo. As a government, we have the, the self-sustainability policy. So food comes first, of course, education at the same time. I have been working almost for 16 years. I remember in 2005, we bring so many experts. Still, some, sometimes we bring experts in, in, uh, in fields we don't know. And once we all get all this information, we were, for the last almost uh, 15 years, we try to do on our own. When I learned um, about the, the, the heat-resistant coral that exists in the Red Sea. It's very unique that they, these coral reefs can resist the increasing temperature in which the goal of the, our globe is now facing. And that there is um, efforts underway to isolate the strand and potentially replant them in dying reefs around the world. That gives me great hope. I wish the, the Caribbean islands would have just a, a, a fraction of what you do here on a national program. Something that I am proud of, that I am glad that we got to share with everyone, was the power of Eritrean women. I am just going to give you some highlights with the women in Eritrea, especially Eritrean women and legal protection. I think in the spirit of the culture of Me Too and the women's empowerment movement that's happening across the world, I'm glad that people got to experience the true essence of what Eritrean women mean to the whole world. And I hope that story can be told and seen um, as an African country, as an East African country that has such a great history in empowering women. Um, and I hope that people can learn from Eritrean women as people develop other nations and even developed nations can learn something as well. And you did my heart some good because up to this point I was wondering where are the women? Where are the girls? First of all, I just want to say from the start, Sophie, thank you to so much for organizing this. This is incredible. I found the lunch with the writers to be fascinating because one of the tensions here in the country, I think, is between the concept of uh, on one side capitalism, on the other side socialism, and how it is that this country is trying to manage that discussion. The concepts of social justice, social justice with an Eritrean face is how it was pre presented. It's a perspective we haven't fully explored. It may be the tension that Eritrea has with the international community uh, revolves around this concept of social justice, which is different than the one that we use in the United States and in the West.
schools. I don't think we have full answers about this, but those writers were so articulate in demonstrating their own perspective on what this means, not to supplant uh, the government's perspective on it, but to give depth to it. I think that perspective, that idea of social justice is a tension that our students are going to want to explore, uh, not just uh, now, but over many years to come. All of us, those who are assigned to the work of culture as musicians, as poets, as writers, as playwrights, so on and so forth, were conscious of uh, promoting Eritrean culture, Eritrean history. When we say the arts, literature, theater, music, the visual arts, and also partly cinema, particularly video cinema, particularly in forms of documentaries, and also photography. All these were documents transmitting the culture, promoting it, bringing it to people who, have, who were not aware of it, be it inside the country or outside the diaspora area. And also the mass media, which was led by the Eritrean radio for the masses. Uh, we had an opportunity to go to Keren. I think one of the most um, delightful parts of the experience was having the opportunity to sit and have an intimate conversation um, with two artists who were so critical during the time of the struggle. Khadija Adam and Tesfai Mahira, I mean Tesfai Mahara Fahira. Fahira. Fahira is a nickname. And they are two freedom fighters that were very active in the in the in the art world during the liberation struggle. Art was not art during the time um, the rebel forces were fighting for independence. It was it went hand in hand with uh, the war. And if it was necessary, there were times that they left their job, their roles as artists to fight on the front lines. Knowing what you're fighting for and knowing what you're fighting against can be very, very um, disheartening. And so they use the music to motivate them. They use the music to tell their story. And that's why the people like it so much, because it, it paints a picture. And it was even a resilience, resilience uh, it helped the fighters build resilience as well, because it was telling their story and it was taking their mind off of what they were at, the job that they were there to do. We had a goal and, and that goal it wasn't, it wasn't a job, we weren't paid to be freedom fighters. We had a goal and that goal was independence and it was our nationalism and our patriotism that drove our work, it wasn't finances. We were receiving no financial support, but in response to the, to that, to the tragedy that the enemy caused for the Eritrean people, the music was used as a bullet, a literary bullet to fight back and to fight against what was going on during that time. She said, we fought tooth and nail by ourselves. So we are a self-reliant country. We built, we fought for our country. We won independence for our country. And now we're rebuilding our country. And so that's something that I would really like you to understand. He's, he's saying that when we were pulling out with the forces, strategically, there was a pregnant woman that was walking and that was hit by a bomb. And so she died. And he said, that's the one memory that I cannot erase from my mind. And, um, a lot of people felt very, it was very, very tragic at that moment. And this is a story that mimics all throughout Erta. There are tragedies like this that have happened in all parts of Erta during the um, struggle for independence.
<laughs> Before I came to Eritrea, I was very much disappointed in Africa. Now I have gotten, I'm now having some confidence in Africa. And it's all because of the hope that I see in Eritrea. And it is my prayer that peace will prevail in this country and Africa will rise again. Water is life, as we all know. We got crops from water, we got trees from water, we got animals from water, everything is from water. So uh, the main aim of this is if we conserve water, if we conserve the soil, uh, everything in our land will be conserved. Um, for example, this side, it will conserve water, the underground water. This is the a whole family city. Father comes, mother comes, the children come, so everybody at the family have, uh, have a great uh, knowledge about this. So they contribute their uh, uh, whatever they can. They get up at uh, 5 a.m., so they leave all their household jobs. Uh, they just came here. They, they know that it's for their own use, so they, they have just group leaders. Uh, they come here voluntarily. Without any payment, without any, without any punishment, they just do it for their own land. That's it. We have to conserve water like this in order to to have a sustained year for almost around all the year. This has become more of a personal journey, and reason I say that is because I get mistaken for Eritrean. I'm Somali American. I get greeted twice, one as, an, as with a group, and also the second is because they're telling me you're home. And I take that very personally, and I'm grateful to that generosity. People have such a strong sense of self-reliance here. They just have such a high spirit about themselves and their culture. Them being able to share that with us has just been amazing. I appreciate the Eritrean people for opening up their homes, uh, for showing me that uh, being in America, I can come back and you would welcome me with open arms. I am extremely proud uh, that I get to show people that this culture does exist. I want to thank Eritrean, the Eritrean people for their hospitality, but beyond their hospitality, the way they have impacted me with that vigor, that verb, to evoke that can-do spirit in my own country. I hope that uh, Eritrean youth, as well as people from other countries, come and experience um, what ERTA is, um, and understand and recognize what it has to offer to our um, international and global context.
During this trip to Eritrea, I have felt very welcomed and taken care of. Uh, the people here are so inviting. I felt like I'd never had to worry about anything. When I'm leaving here on Saturday, we'll be with a sad heart because I fell in love with the people. And it will be with a hopeful heart because so many of the wonderful things that are in progress here right now can heal the world. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to have seen this and for all the people that have made it possible. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. The students have really seen the true Eritrea. They have gone through the usual journey, starting out with reading about Eritrea beforehand, being cautious, not sure about this place, then coming and seeing the incredible welcome that we have received, the generosity of the people, the true self-reliance, a completely different vision. We've been looking at development and we've been looking at the gap in narrative between what is said and what the realities are on the ground. It is wonderful to be eyewitnesses to what is happening in Eritrea. Thanks so much, our hosts, for everything they did to make it possible. Yakinyele. 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 Ah, Yakinyele. 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 Okay, Yakinyele. Is that it? Hi, my name...